when they say phantom power is 48 volts, it's actually anywhere from 3 to 48 volts. Uh, you know, the wall is 110 volts. So this is 48 volts, but very low amperage. It's nothing that would, uh, you do hear sometimes of people getting killed when a microphone gets dunked in the water, like, you know, a dude drops his mic in baptism. That's more because it grounds the whole board down the ground lane, mm -hmm. and then you get, you get the high amperage, <laughs> 20 amps or whatever. Um, so this is low <coughs> voltage, or excuse me, high voltage, low current, 48 volts. Um, it can damage a board if you're feeding phantom power to a device that doesn't need it because it's supplying it to that unit and all, all the unit may be doing is shunting that to a ground, loading it up or shorting it out. Um, so I, I would encourage you to start with it off. It's always good to leave your, leave your fader down when you're making that change. A lot of times it will introduce a nice pop for you. Um, but that's what that is. <coughs> phantom power powers a microphone should it need it. Underneath that is pad, and then it says line. Okay, so you see, there's a volume you're hearing. If I were to pad that to 10 dB, that's the difference. That's all that little button does is it pads at 30 dB. I think this board's 30. Yeah, it doesn't say, but it's usually a 30 dB pad. So if you find you've got any particular guitar that's coming in, an acoustic, whatever, you've got it turned all the way down and then this is still really loud, that's when you'd want to use the pad. So all right, I'm going to go ahead and turn on the pad, that way I can get in this range of the board. This board is designed for you to mix around Unity. That's the pad. Uh, I've noticed it is, the pad is on the, uh, these two channels here. Um, it's also the line selection. A microphone uh, runs at about uh, 60 millivolts. Um, an audio signal would be at about, uh, well, well, minus 60 dBU. An audio signal would be at plus 4 or minus 10. So you get microphone levels are down here, then line levels are up here. So that's why you want to use a pad so you don't blow off the channel. Any questions on what a pad does? So does the pad bring it down or bring it up? The pad's um, pulling the pad it down so you can pull up on the, yep, on the, the pad, yes, exactly. you can pot it up higher, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, okay. it allows you to lower the signal coming in so your gain staging okay. is correct. Okay. Yep. All right, under that is gain. Gain is your amplification. You are deciding how much you're amplifying the signal that's coming in. Where it gets confusing is, well, you've got gain, but then you've also got a fader. The way to think about it is, this is your amplification, and then this is the amount you're hearing of it. So this is your overall, how, you know, how much you're amplifying the signal, and this is how much you want to hear of it. So ideally, a good way to set it um, say you're plugging in device one, never heard it before in your life. You would start with it all the way down, pad off, you know, put it around minus 20, and start bringing your gain up, get a sense for how loud it is. If it's really loud right now, go ahead and kick your pad on. And then you're going to want to bring your fader at about zero and set your gain based on that. The reason for that is when you're mixing, what you want to avoid is this is off and then that's really loud. Mm -hmm. and this is off and that's really loud because what's going to happen is you're going to forget and want to fade it up. Plus the accuracy of the console is very minimal here where they've designed this board to be pretty accurate around this, this level. It's scale. So this here, if you're making less than, uh, like you can't physically hear a three decibel difference. I know you might be like, well, I think I can, but most people can't hear a three decibel difference, but you can a six. So if you find yourself, you know, mixing like this, you're not mixing in a way where people can hear. If you are making about 6 dB, 3 to 6 dB increments, you are mixing in a way people can hear. All right, so you got gain. The way to set that is basically you don't want to be seeing your peak level here. You know, if you're hitting in the red, it's obviously bad. If that's sustained, you can blow a channel. Uh, one of the reasons why I recommended this board is every single channel in this console is like its own circuit board connected with a ribbon cable. So if you do blow one, you can actually replace a single channel, whereas the last Mackie board, it's kind of all integrated. So if you do blow one, it's not the end of the world, but Brian will be super mad if you do. All right, game. Under that, HPF. That's Any okay. clue? High pass filter. All right, what does high pass filter do for you? Put me on the spot. <laughs> uh, open question for anybody. What's the, what do you think the high pass filter would do? I always get confused on this because there's a low pass filter and a high pass filter. 
High pass filter basically lets all the high stuff pass through and it rolls it off. I want to say, see, this board doesn't really tell you, but let me see if I can show you. <laughs> and see if you can hear a difference in the sound. you would actually notice it was with your subwoofers. So that being the case, the only time you would really want to use that particular high pass filter would be on something where you don't want the bottom end, don't need the bottom end. So what would be an example of a signal here coming into the board where you're you don't pinking, need that bottom end? You're pinking on, your, on the bass drum on the electric drums. What about the bass guitar? Bass guitar? All right, typically where you would want the high pass filter on is on vocals. Okay. So say if TJ or Brian says, hey, open your Bible, and you hear the B, you don't, you don't need that super low bass and right. vocal mic. So you turn it on there. If you were to turn it on the drums, uh, what you would lose is some of that kick in the yeah. thump. Yeah. So you probably wouldn't want it for drums. I mean, if, if it's distorting, that'd be a matter of maybe, or if it's clipping out, maybe dying back to bottom or the overall game. All right, let me ask this, um, because I've noticed that in the past, where we don't have much in the way of the the sound coming out of the subs for the bass drum, right. but it's peaking. But it's, yeah. Um, I think what you're experiencing there is probably a lack of power in the bottom end, and, you're, and we're trying to compensate with that by, you know, cranking as right. much as possible, like the subs would be cranked out. Um, and that, really all you can do is all you can do. You know, and, and I think you guys have uh, you've had those experiences where you drive it to the point where the subs say, yeah, I'm done for That's a little while, enough, you know, yeah. they're going to protect mm -hmm. them. Um, one solution for that would be to protest in front of the new church offices with a sign that says, we want more subs. <laughs> and uh, your voice will be heard. Is that, is that correct, Brian? I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. So, uh, I apologize. Yeah, that would just be, you know, as far as what you got is what you got in the bottom end. But um, the only thing you can do is just, you know, push them as far as they can go and try not to, you know, break it. So, if you, uh, if you do need to dial back the bottom to keep it from clipping, or another, another way you could get around that would be if you did have an open channel like channel 12. I don't know, does that, uh, does your drum kit allow you to have... Uh, discrete outs. Can you come just drum kick out? Yeah, you, you can on his kit, not ours. I'd have to check. Right, because what it's you could mitty. do is have the kick on a separate channel so it wouldn't be bogging down the overall, you know, if you find it's driving it too much. So you can run it separate and then it right. have its own track and right. then run the rest of the stuff. You could, you could break it back. out. Yeah, where we're it's going, I don't know if it's worth it. No. Brian's vision uh, for, he's probably took, can I talk a little bit about what you're thinking? Um, is to, to go towards an acoustic drum setup. So that would give you guys, you know, there is a little bit of a stigma associated with live performance with uh, electronic drums. Uh, and so you'll, you'll be able to get maybe the feel and look you're, you're hoping for with acoustic, but you want to do it in a way that's controlled so it doesn't just blow everyone out. So that's the, uh, the direction moving forward is to get acoustic set but have. Uh, you know, a shield in place with the roof and some sorbers, some headboards. And mic it all? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, uh, you think in like, kick snare, tom 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 overhead, overhead, or tom tom overhead, overhead, yes. something like that. Uh, you, typically I've found if you're doing that, on you know, one side you just got hats and like a crash, you can usually get, get that fairly well with just one good condenser. I had a question about yes, that. Um, now how, when we do that, how are we going to be able to do it through the hearback system? Um, uh, the probably easiest way would probably be to group the subs or group the uh, drums down to a couple channels, which 
you're on channels here anyway, so we're looking at a way where you could get a little rack mount mixture that the drums would be on and feed and into feed your into stereo. So you kind of daisy chain mixtures, and you just send a left right you know, to the avioms. Okay. Uh, so it's like, yeah, it's 15, 16 or something. Yeah. So you'd have to mix it down. What, what I do uh, yeah. at, the, at the summit, we do like kick snare and then overhead, overhead. And then uh, sometimes we'll mix the tom into like the snare channel or group group some of the top drums. Or, uh, it all depends. And from week to week, you can change it. It's the beauty of it if you had to because of more guitars, less guitars, more vocals, less vocals. Cool. Okay, so high pass filter, you would want on input signals that you don't want to bass. If you want to bass, leave it up. If you don't want to bass, so push it down. All right, next part. One of my favorite parts of console is your EQ. These knobs, just as this gain is the overall amplification, this is the amplification of certain parts of the signals. And this is all decided by frequencies. Yes. Um, so the way that works, I wanted to show you, uh, you don't happen to have any pink noise. How do you go into the, uh, you go in quarter inch or you just go in USB? Eighth end of the computer. Absolutely. Explain that sound. It sounds like a waterfall. This is called pink noise. Uh, it's commonly used for uh, measuring the response of a PA system. So what I'm doing is I am putting in equal energy at equal octaves. That's what pink noise is. Uh, white noise is equal energy at, at all frequencies. Pink noise is closer to how you perceive sound, so that's why I typically it's used. So it's every frequency all at once, equal energy, so it should make this perfectly flat. Now, no speaker reproduces sound perfectly. You know, you're using magnetic field to drive a voice coil, pushing air, different frequencies. Um, so there are very expensive speakers that do it very well, but nothing's ever perfect. <coughs> uh, you're just giving reverb in the room, all stuff. So when I push this through, you'll notice it's pretty flat. This here. Uh, 316 hertz. A lot of that is, uh, well, you can even hear. Raphael, Nathan, do you guys want to come around this yeah, side so you guys can? Yeah. Here, you can take my seat back here. I'll bring this around. That way you guys can see it Yeah. So if we're all quiet for a second, you can actually see the way the room sounds. This, this, this here is going to be your air handler noise. You can hear the air going. Here, that's the uh, the sound that's coming out of the speakers is interacting with that noise that's already in the air. The air handler typically acts like uh, remember, like in Top Gun, remember they'd use countermeasures, you know, the heat sinking missiles. They'll send out all the heat and confuse it. Basically, the uh, the sound that's coming out of the speakers will hit that existing noise and bounce off it, interact with it. Uh, so you're going to be fighting that on the bottom end. But thankfully, intelligibility. Like we noticed, syllabants up here and consonants is a little above that, so it won't compete with speech. If anything, it helps you block out noise from the rest of the YMCA. It, it acts like a masking. So if I turn up every frequency, equal energy at equal octaves, pretty flat. Um, the microphone in my computer is not the best microphone. You know, it's a laptop mic, so it's just approximating. But let me show you, if I adjust this top knob, which is just labeled HF, not extremely really helpful, but high frequency. You can see the biggest change is pretty much right here. So your high frequency, what it is, is it's a, if you can picture a filter, it's a curve like this, an amplifier just on certain frequencies. And so what it does is it bumps up here. And you can just bump it up or down. The next one is called a sweepable min. And the reason why it's called a sweepable min is because you can do this. So all I'm doing 
is the bottom blue knob picks how much you want to boost or cut. The top green one here picks whatever frequency that is. Where that becomes important is if you're having an issue with feedback, you can use the green knob to figure out what frequency is feeding back and then use the blue knob to cut it out. Extremely helpful when things are going south and you got to act pretty quick. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to make a mic feedback for you and then we can play name that frequency here in a second. So this first one, the green knob allows me to fade from 15 kilohertz, which is almost at the top. You can hear to about 20,000 hertz. Um, little kids can hear up to 22,000 hertz. That's why they have those mosquito ringtones. Have you heard about that, kids mm -hmm. in school? They've got these super high ringtones they can hear, but the teacher can't because they're old. Um, so PAs are designed to usually go up to about 20,000 hertz. Um, so I can go from 15 all the way down to 500. Pretty low. Well. So that would be like, you know, this upper, upper register. Below it is your low mids, which obviously is the next range down. That lets me go from 1K right here. So if you notice, there is an overlap between your low and your mid frequencies. There's an overlap right there. So I'm going from here down to 35, which is way down here at the bottom. Uh, just so you guys are aware, your top boxes are set to go from here all the way down to about 125. Anything from here down is all subs. Your subs cut off at about 32. They're not real effective. They're, they're actually best at 40 to 50 hertz, which is right around in here. So your subs are only for this. You, you put the most amount of energy into generating your lowest frequencies all the time. And then higher frequencies are easier to generate. So you got your high frequency, which is kind of like a general. You got your sweepable mids, the top blue ones, the bottom blue one, and then you got your bottom bass. Let's hear that. All right, if you'll notice, when I sweep down to 35 hertz, you don't even hear it anymore. See that right there? That's where your top box is cut off. Now I'm under that, you don't even hear what I'm doing basically. Alright, so lastly is your very bottom knob, which is just a wide, low frequency filter. Now if I turn the subs up, it's all on the bottom. So that's your EQ. Any questions on? Any particular knob, when you should use them, when you shouldn't. Can you repeat what you said at the very beginning when you were talking about, you know, the green knob where you're choosing the frequency yep. to get feedback? Yep. Uh, the green one picks the frequency, and then the blue one either amplifies or decreases that specific frequency. Okay. The difference between um, the blue one on the top, which is deceptive, is you don't get to pick the frequency. It's just set, high frequency, and it's a wide filter which means when I turn that up, it's affecting a whole range of frequencies, not just one. Whereas this green one is a little more specific. They give you what's called a narrow band filter. So you're only hitting specific frequencies at one time. It's more helpful. Uh, it's called a sweepable mid. So you can sweep the frequency, cut it out, or add it in. Um, let me give you some examples of where you could use this. Uh, in a uh, constructive way, Say Brian singing. Uh, can you talk for a second? Yes. Check one, two, talking. Three. Okay. When you hear his voice, he's got uh, some lower tones, but then there's like a drive frequency. It's kind of that upper frequency. Uh, you hear it accentuated out the wazoo when you listen to like an old Britney Spears track. You know, she's got that, uh, that real airy, raspy top. That is where you could bring that out in Brian's voice a little bit more. If you want him to be able to say, oh, it's just so muddy and I can't get the vocals to come out. That's where you could bring up that 2K to 3K range. So if I would turn this real right here, you can say it says 3K, 4K. Turn it to that, and then just start bringing it up slowly, and you'll hear the difference in his in his voice. Uh, okay, let's go ahead and just do a quick demo. No, it's not on. It's not turned on. You gonna do that nowadays? Checking, checking. All right, let's do. 
do this, but I'm going to give you this mic. We're just going to swing around a little bit while you're talking. Say your favorite Bible verse. Oh, story. Jesus loves me, this I know, this is the story. So before I, uh, before I necessarily change the frequency, I'm just going to go ahead and put the, uh, the gain knob for the upper mid at like, you know, just boost it a little bit, about 3 o'clock. All right, keep talking for me. Checking 3, 4, this is all for the sound. Can you hear the change in the tone? 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, check, 2, check. Alright, so ideally, what sounds good is pretty subjective. Uh, people can't ever agree on what sounds good, mm -hmm. but people can usually agree on what sounds bad. Ringing <laughs> sounds bad. Uh, you know, real muddy, you know, it's like a sock, you know, that sounds bad. Um, the sock sound is 200 hertz. I'll make, I'll, I'll make uh, Brian sound like he's talking through a sock. Turn the bottom one to about 200, boost it up. I'm going to take the top out a little bit here, roll it off. Now go ahead and talk to Brian. This is my impression of a sock. sock. It sucks. No one likes the sock. It's just unpleasant, not clear, you know, couldn't understand what he's saying. Um, so we know that sounds bad. So a way to fix that, if for some reason he comes in, he's like, hey, I've got a cold today, you know, can you help me out? That's what you can use for it. Now, feedback-wise, let's try this. I'm going to go ahead and make his microphone feedback. But check this out. Right now, the EQ is flat. I'm not boosting or cutting anything. It's called detent. No, uh, no gain, no cut, just straight up open channel. I'm going to turn it up here. There it goes. Check. It's on the upper range, which I do have another filter, you know, this top green one, top super mid. Sure. Do. Quick thing for y'all, um, if you have a smartphone, there are some free apps in the store that will let you use your phone. Um, when I'm mixing, a lot of times I'll just set it out. I wouldn't ever like, um, if you look up, a, it's called RTA. Um, mine's called RTA Pro. I ended up buying the version. But if you'll notice, it's the same. Same thing, obviously. It's um, it is your cell phone, so I wouldn't set like a PA with it. It's not like a scientific measurement, but as far as playing, name that frequency, it'll do it pretty accurately um, on the whole. So that's a good thing you could just you know set up here. If you're hearing like TJ's talking, uh, anytime you're trying to make some adjustments in uh, a live situation, you always want to go slow, do it over time, and take your time because. You're going to be feeling the stress of, oh, everyone's hearing this, it's bad. And unless it's really bad, you can just take your time and kind of dial it back. And people won't even remember it as an event. If you make it an event by shutting off his mic and say, oh, and kill it, people kind of remember the dramatic, you know. So always make nice, slow adjustments, take your time. And that way, if you're going slow, you won't ever hear that, Rah! you know, it won't get away from it. You'll hear it start ringing first, and you can just kind of take your time. So always make gentle adjustments, especially live. Uh, during sound check, it's good because even though it's feeding back in the house, because it's going through the microphone, it's directly on the band's eardrums. And if you want to make someone mad, just yell into their <laughs> ear with like one kilohertz, you know. And it's you hate to say it, but it is your fault. <laughs> so you want to be gentle with people. Uh, so make nice, uh, gentle moves. You don't have to worry about that. All right. And one thing to consider, I'm going to go ahead and have uh, I'm going to put my uh, EQ back to flat, back to normal. I'm going to have Brian talk. Checking one, two, three. You guys hear a little four, bit of ring there? Check ring two, three, three. You know, typically three, that's what you'll hear before. So if you're not sure, say you don't have this handy dandy thing going on, the best way to make something sound better is to make it sound worse. Doesn't make sense, but let me show you what I mean. Check two, three. A little bit of ring. Check two, three, four. I know it's lower. 
Check two, so three, we'll four. Check, one. check two, three, four. Put it at like two o'clock. Two, three, and just start four. start going with the green ones. Check two, through. three, four. Check two, three, four. Check two, three, four. Check two, three, four. One, two, three. Check, check. Two, three. All right, so what I'm doing is I'm swinging through the frequencies to see which one pings, which one bounces back, which one makes the ringing worse. And as soon as I find that... Check, two, three, four. Right check, two, three, four. Check, you got it. two. So what you do is, in order, to make, in order to make it sound better, like in a sound check, go ahead and make it ring out a little bit more, and then you know as soon as you get on that, it's going to light up a Christmas tree and take it out. And you just like... You're targeting the frequency and then removing it. Do you, so do you suggest in live environment when we're in the middle of service, do you suggest that method of trying to make uh, it worse to make it better? I would suggest taking your time and sound check to do it then. That way, if you do encounter it live, um, I wouldn't make it sound worse before you make it better. I'd, I'd kind of do the opposite where I would, I would cut down the frequency and then start swinging it till where it gets better. So you're not actively making it worse to find it. You're just kind of taking your time and, and trying to do it that way. This is definitely faster because I can swing through and boom, cut it out. And we're next on the next one. Yeah, but at the same time, you're going to have a, a different sound. Like, say, TJ, we're doing a mic check with TJ, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning yep. with no bodies in here right. versus, you know, a packed house. That's correct. So, um, but one thing about that is that doesn't change the scientific principles of how the microphone picks up sound and how. Right. So you'll you'll find it that way, but then the bodies will make it worse or better. And typically, if you've got it already found, all you'll have to do maybe is just make it. Where where you do get a variable like that is uh, TJ sound check and say, Hey, I'm TJ. But then when he gets preaching, he's louder. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know. I haven't heard TJ preach yet, but he's probably a little bit louder when he gets excited. Mm -hmm. That'll make that feedback thing worse because he's talking louder. So if you can find it, it's just a matter of how much you need to cut it. You don't want people getting around. Let me ask you this as well. Um, volume seems to make a difference in our services. Yes. Um, yep. For instance, Dustin runs often runs second service volume ports or uh, uh, sound ports, right. and he pushes it hotter than we do in the first service. Yeah. I'm okay with that, but. Sometimes when it gets louder is when I, I start sensing some of the ringing. Yeah. Are there certain things to look for in that that we can all? Yes, there is. Uh, what you're running into is called PAG, Potential Acoustic Gain. Um, it's a mathematical scientific principle. You cannot bend the rules of physics. You know, they apply on the earth. But what that means is you can only amplify an input signal so much before it's going to feed back. Mm -hmm. You know, it's acoustics. It's physics. Uh, all feedback is, is basically the microphone hearing itself. As soon as that happens, it's like, oh, I hear that, and I'm going to amplify it. I'm going to amplify it, and then it happens. So when you increase your, your noise floor, so to speak, if I make this louder, say if it's going to feedback at this level, the closer I get there, the more my margins are wiped out. So what happens is when you push a little bit harder, you're, you're, you're reaching the limits of your potential acoustic gain. Every time you open an input source, like if I just have one microphone open, I can get it louder than if I have three microphones open. Mm -hmm. With three mics, I can probably only get them all about that loud. With one mic, I could get it this loud. It's like a synergistic uh, kind of concept. Um, so the more open inputs you have, the less your potential acoustic gain is. So when you start running into that, it's even more critical that during uh, sound check, you take the time, find your problem frequencies, kind of dial them out, and then say if Dustin comes in behind in service two, he can see where you've already got it set. And once he knows that you've tried the Brandon Munger method of making it better, he'll be like, oh, sweet. And he can just dial that back a little bit more and, and kind of keep rolling. Uh, but all that does is that just limits that particular frequency from feeding back. If you keep pushing beyond it, like we saw earlier, the next one will feed back. And then if you cut that one, the next one, you know, because you're all, you're getting that threshold across the board. And then you get into a dynamic situation where um, you might have it dialed in with one microphone, but then when the other microphone, uh, when he gets louder, it can actually impact your microphone. One of the things you'll notice when you introduce the compression is that lowers your potential acoustic gain because when you get loud, It'll clamp it down, and then when you let off, it opens up. So if if uh, 
if you have your threshold a little too low, every time you're talking, it's squeezing it, and then when you back away, it can go, whoa, and then nothing's, you know, he's not even singing and starts feeding back. That's one thing you'll have to, this becomes even more critical when you get compression because as compression squeezes a signal, it's going to change the EQ because it's going to compress the ones that are the highest, you know. It's going to react to the peaks. So as you pull down your peaks, your other frequencies come up, and then they can start feeding back under compression. Then when you let go, this will feed, so it, it can get a little more dynamic. Is this a good breaking point to talk about compression compressors a little bit? Uh, well, let me get through the board here, and then we'll okay. look at that. I'll hold up that uh, unit you have. We'll talk a little bit about that. Yes. Um, our biggest, I think one of our biggest issues, like when TJ is speaking, is, or one of the things that comes up the most, is he sounds like he's in a garbage can. Mm -hmm. Yes. So how do a metal one or a plastic one? Because um, well, there's usually a plastic liner on the bottom, right. but it is a metal. But it's definitely yeah. a garbage can. Yeah. Right. Um, a lot of that happens when um, there's about three things you can do. One of them's EQ. You know, you can help it with EQ. All EQ is going to do is compensate for the characteristics of the microphone. So the, the number one thing you can do to help is microphone placement. If he's wearing an earworm microphone, if it's a countryman, best place is right on the cleft of his chin. You're going to want it right about here. Any closer, you're kind of overshooting the mouth. Any further back, you're going to get air out of the corner of the mouth. Because when you say certain syllables, you kinda, you'll kind of you hear a It sounds like a crack or a ripple mm -hmm. on the mic. Uh, any higher, you get, a, you get almost a lispy sound. It you know, sounds like it has a lisp, even though he doesn't. Um, for <laughs> Jonathan... First couple Sundays, we had some new mics, and I was like, man, that dude's got a lisp. I never noticed it. <laughs> it was just all EQ. Actually, it was mic placement. Um, so, per you know, if you could help him, because he can't really even see it, you know, especially if it's shifting around, help him to land it right right here. Just not, you don't want it under the chin, you don't want it above mm -hmm. the mouth, you want it right in line with that cliff right here. And uh, anytime you double the distance <laughs> between the source and the microphone, you half the amount of volume you can get out of it. You know, the potential acoustic gain. So if you can get that source as close to the mic as you can, that's your best case scenario. So it, it applies, you know, remember when we used to use a lapel mics, if you put it down here, you couldn't hear, mm -hmm. you couldn't get anything before you start feeding back. And that's why Headmore and mics got so popular because, you know, he's reading it super loud and he looks up and it's gone. Because you just doubled the distance between the mic and the, and the uh, you know, the voice. So... Microphone placement would be the first thing to pay attention to. Make sure it's in the proper spot right around here. It'd be awesome. Secondly, um, if you're having feedback issues, like if I could get TJ in here and he'd talk, you know, you'd see uh, his upper syllables in here. You'd see his consonants. If it just so happens that the microphone is feeding back at the same frequencies he's talking in, what you find yourself doing is cutting out the frequencies that his vocal range is in. So you're kind of... Uh, taking his speech out of the signal. And that's where it can sound distant, sound like that. So, um, in those cases, I'll typically vary the microphone selection. Say if a countryman's going to do that and going to feed back, you can try a different mic. Um, you've got another one to try now. Brian just picked up, uh, did I leave it out in there? Yeah, it's out in the car. Uh, we've, you've got a backup mic now, so if you run into any crackling, you can real quick just swap it out. Um, and so this other mic will have a little bit different frequency. Uh, country beds are pretty good. I have had issues with them. They come, I don't know if you looked at but inside this pack here are, uh, let's see if you can still have them. They're little caps. Mm -hmm. And each cap is labeled with some handy dandy, uh, you might not have them in here anymore, uh, but you might, you might want to find them. But the caps, uh, they were in these little pouches, and what they do is one of them says, like, very crispy. Crispy, mildly crispy, flat, <laughs> and uh, it just slides over the end caps and helps shape the waveforms going into mm -hmm. it. So if you find um, his S's are too, you know, too biting, you can't do it. You can slap on one of these caps and, and try it out. Or I don't know if you know where those are, but they go the way of all flesh because they're so small. They get uh, they get gone pretty quick. But uh, I might have some extra ones. I can. We used to go through. The, oh, 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 yeah, right here. This bag is empty, which mm. means it may be on the mic. But this says uh, crisp response, and it shows you a little waveform. I'm going to pass it around. And where you can see that bump, you can almost compare it to this waveform here. Mm -hmm. See how it's showing like a high-end bump? That's going to make it sound super crispy. 
that's just this. Yes, yes, sir. I don't think there's one on there. <laughs> yeah, that's just wide open. Too. Real so there are different. There are different caps you can put on that to help change the characteristic of that mic. Um, so yeah, verify microphone placement. Second, check your EQ. Make sure you're not cutting out frequencies that would make them sound like a trash can, or where you're hollowing out like I did with him. Then the third thing, the only thing you can do is the further away he can get from the speakers, the more gain you'll have. You know, the closer you put your microphone source to your mains, the lower your potential acoustic gain. So in this particular setup, it's really good because you've got that speaker centered on this section and that speaker centered on that section. So that's great. So what you can change, instead of moving everybody, is you can move TJ where if he's out in front of the mains versus in line with them, or move the speakers down or up or whatever you got to do to, to, uh, to adjust. But those would be the things I would experiment with a little bit to see if you could clean that up and help. Uh, and then I'd try the Samson, try that other mic to see if he likes it better. The Samson has, uh, like this microphone here, if he finds it's drooping down or whatever, you got to sit there and bend it, you know, kink it to grip the ear better. The other Samson microphone has a little rubber band piece that goes here and you can slide that around to actually push on the back of the ear to help it hang better. So it's got some nice features like that. Any other questions on EQ and how you can use it? Don't be afraid to use it. I would definitely, uh, you know, sound check is the best time to mess with that. Um, and if the band understands what you're doing when you hear, you know, if you're just hitting the feedback a little bit, making corrections, that good. I wouldn't sit there and let it, you know, just roll and, and hurt everybody while you're doing that process. Like I said, the, the key is to just take your time and hear it ring and then back it out. It can be hard when everyone's doing their thing. Uh, but it's worth the effort. Uh, and that would be my main thing is gradual adjustments are best. Anything dramatic is going to give you dramatic results. Only time you want dramatic is if you're trying to fix something that's dramatically bad. You know, if someone plugs in a cheap, you know, like a Seagull guitar or something with a bridge pickup and it's nasty, you're trying to get some attack out of it or something, that's when you'd start cranking. But or the bark is bearing. Spencer plays Seagulls. <laughs> well, some say, I mean, a lot of it's not nasty. Yet. When you have the three mics up there, we talked about one mic, yes. you have three, you start getting feedback. Yeah. How do we narrow down to which mic, when, especially like, you know, when you're on yeah. mid-surface there? Say we have, okay, the question was, say you've got three microphones that you need to have open during any specific song, or are open during a song, what can you do to help with that feedback? All right, um, the number one thing you can do is shut a microphone off anytime it's not in use. So say you know that uh, Mary Lou is only singing harmonies on the chorus. So when you're mixing, the reason why these faders are here isn't so, okay, service is starting, all right, everything's on, all right, we're set, and I'm just gonna check Facebook and do my thing. You know, the reason why they're here is so you can make, and you can be aggressive about making this experience the best you can. So say Mary Lou is only doing vocals on the chorus. You know, I know the songs, I listen, Brian told me what we're playing this week, the set list. So I've been listening to them and I know, okay, it's cool, it's got to be loud here, quiet here. So what I'm going to do is lead, I'm just going to tuck her in, just in case she does throw out a Praise Jesus or a vocal embellishment. And then I'm going to bring her up. And so what you're doing is you're basically manually gating, it's called a gate. Um, but all the gate does, it's like the gate on a fence. It closes, it shuts the mic off, or opens it up. So you're basically riding your levels to, to increase your gain and keep it as clean as possible. Because ideally, if someone's not playing, like if Brian's playing guitar and he switches to electric, you know, you'd shut the guitar, you shut it off. Right? Same thing with vocals. You know, you can bring them down to help them in a support role, but uh, help with the feedback a bunch. So ride those levels. And um, if you have a female singer, who is like a you know, mezzo-soprano or, or a higher singer, you can roll out some of the bottom and you're notch, that's called notching your mix. When we get to the artistic part, I'll show you about that. But you can notch your mix to help uh, decrease the opportunity for the low end of feedback. So that, you know, if it's two ladies singing with a dude, you give the dude the bottom end because he's got a lower voice and take it out of the And you can hear, you know, it's like an intensive way to, uh, another way is, uh, you know, I'm not sure if uh, Brian's guitar sounds right. So if, if you're mixing along, something's distorting, or like you were saying, you're not sure which one's feeding back, you can go through and pre-fade listen to whatever one you want 
and here that was feedback or that was worse than all the others. So prepaid listen. Uh, where I got bit the other day, first time I've done this in I don't know, probably 10 years, uh, we do uh, video teaching at the summit for some of our campuses or for the uh, Oak Ridge campus. And uh, so I'm queuing it up in the back, the welcome's going on. I've got two channels, one for like prepaid listen, one for the Johnson's first words were, hey, how y'all doing? And so the welcome's going on, and I'm queuing it up, and I hit play. I got my headphones on, and I hear, hey, how y'all doing? So, okay, great. I shut it off, and I realized everyone in the house heard it. Because <laughs> the look on their face is like, I'm like, oh. <laughs> so pretty embarrassing. So if you have it up, and you hit prepaid listen, it's still going to be in the house. But I do think, and I have to check, I don't know, yes. Even with the channel muted, you can still hear what's going on. So if, if they've got a video or you're trying to cue up a track, so when TJ's done, you're going to roll the sweet new ACDC track that just ties into the message perfectly. You can cue it up, listen, pause it where you want it, and you, know, you don't have to worry about being in the house. You don't have to do what I did. All right, lastly, it's fader. <coughs> Zero means you're getting 100% of whatever this gain is set at. So if you've got 30 dB gain, zero means you're letting all 30 come straight through. You're not accentuating or cutting. As you fade down, you're uh, fading down. Uh, infinity is that sign at the bottom, which is, for all intents and purposes, off. Uh, so infinity is typically minus 90 dB. You know, once you get past that, you just can't hear it. It's too minute. Um, so if you'll notice, 30 to there. You know, that's 60 dB drop just in that last inch. We're right here, this first inch is only like a you know, 8 dB drop. So like I was saying before, you hear logarithmically. So this board is most accurate here when you make small changes. Or changes like this are small changes. Or down here, changes like this are huge changes. Granted, it might not be a change you can hear a whole lot, but look, the difference between infinity and minus 30. Then 30, minus 30 to 20. That's a bigger difference than from minus 30 to off. So halfway is there. You know, so it's scaled. So that's important to remember. When you go to set your gain, go ahead and put your fader around the middle with this all the way down. And then start bringing it up so you get that gain structure good. And chances are, the way this system is set up, um, proper PA calibration would be that this is operating in the middle of its range, you know, not all the way open, not all the way closed. Coming through the DSP, same thing, not all the way at the top, not all the way at the bottom. When it hits your speakers, you know how they have a volume on the back? They're not all the way, you know, pushed or all the way off. Um, a lot of times I will set those all the way open, just so you can't ever make them louder by accident. Um, but everything, gain structure, should be kind of in the middle of this range. That's to say, when you have this at zero, and it's about right out here, it'll be about right for the band in their avion. Because this, this unit here is set up to operate in the middle of that range with proper gain structure. If you find down here, you know, this is, this is loud, when the band has that channel on their avion, they'll get the same thing. They'll get two little clicks, and then it's super loud in their ears, and they don't want that either. So chances are, if you're in the middle of your range here, they're going to be happy too. They'll have enough. And, now, if you find the band saying, I've got it all the way up and I still can't hear, that probably means back here your gain's too low. I don't know, have, has that ever happened for you guys? Yeah. Yep, yeah, so it's, you got to kind of balance out what you need versus what they need and help them love it. Help them the best you can. All right, over here, I'm trying to remember what this is all for. Oh, this is your monitor out. These are just different options that you're not using currently. Uh, these are your mains. They're set again to be running about zero. Sometimes you can, I guess you can run them depending on how you need to. Depends on who's running it. True. <laughs> Any questions or anything? Why are we running two channels for the computer? Uh, I don't think you are. Like right we now are. there's some... Yeah, yeah, there's two. Okay, yeah. I'm just coming out left. I think in this particular case, it's because there is different information on the right channel from the left channel. And the way you want to sum it is the way it's going to be summed in here. You don't want to, uh, it's called loading an input. When you take two inputs and jam them together and then stick it in one, you're loading up the impedance. 
Um, you can split audio. You can split audio a hundred times on the out, but you can never combine on an in. As long as you maintain a ten to one impedance ratio between the output of a device and the input of the next device, you're all set. Typically, like the output impedance of this is like ten thousand ohms, and then input impedance would be like one thousand. What was the program you're running for your Mac? Uh, smart. Smart. S M A A R T. They spelled it a very smart way. Mm. Uh, I think it's made by Rational Acoustics is the name of the company. It used to be owned by EAW, which is the version I've got. There is a newer version, and you can download it for free, and it'll work for 30 days. Okay. So any questions on any of the actual technical features of the mixer?